For the last 25 years, I have been involved with a volunteer group that assists law enforcement with crime scene investigations. As a consequence, I've become quite interested in high-speed field methods because of the telescoped exploration timeline. Unlike typical geological site investigations, a typical crime scene survey usually takes place over a 48-hour period. I'll start by describing a project from 1982 and 83. Next, I'll compare the present with 82-83 in terms of field equipment. Then I'll speculate on what the future might look like, tempered by a reality check as defined by affordability, connectivity, and practicality, and recommendations for a cheap field configuration. Finally, if time permits, I'll give a live demonstration of one possible field configuration based on a tablet, GPS, and Google Earth. Back in 1982, I started a project for Wold Minerals about 100 miles southeast of El Paso, Texas, within a Precambrian window between the towns of Sierra Blanca and Van Horn. This area is called the Alamore Talc District. Prior to this, I had worked a project for Amex Exploration just to the west of this area, drilling for molybdenum within some tertiary lacolis. I spent roughly three years in this region, and frankly, I fell in love with the geology. If you like structure, this is Mecca. If you dislike complexity, this is hell. Multiple episodes of deformation from the Grenvillian through the tertiary have created folds, boudinage, imbricate thrust sheeting, and nap structures. A useful analogy is to take a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, place it horizontally in a vise, compress it to an inch, and slice off the material that squeezes out the top. Oh, and do it all in a high-pressure cooker. Oh, look, vertically tilted bedding with alternating beds of talc and silicified metadola stone. A wonderful opportunity to create a measured section. We start at the left edge. About six feet into the section, we realize that the previous four feet are being duplicated in reverse. The same thing happens as we continue to move from left to right, over and over and over. This seemingly innocent-looking cut is actually many recumbent folds squished together to confound, confuse, and amaze. In 1982, Epcot Center opened, John Belushi died of an overdose, E.T. phoned home, and Time magazine declared the computer as the person of the year. And this skinny punk with a full head of hair and an Apple II in his hotel room was driven to write a log plotting program because talc drills very quickly and he couldn't keep up with the logging and the drafting. This guy, being me, delineated, delineated 21 million tons of baby powder and later went on to start a geological software company called Rockware. 28 years later, Rockware was contracted to come back and do it again. The result was 145 million tons. Given that I was twice the age, special attention was given to comparing the past with the present. I can tell you right now that this old guy can cover just as much ground as the skinny punk. The difference, however, is that sitting down on an outcrop to have lunch or taking notes is a big mistake. Because getting back up is a challenge. By the way, this ellipsoid of rock is a boudin of the silicified metadola stone floating within a talc lens. Be still, my heart. So, we've got an excellent baseline for comparing the past with the present, and the, re and the results are fairly dramatic. Two years of field work in 1982-83 can be performed within three weeks in 2010. Two months of computations and drafting in 82-83 can be performed within a couple of hours in 2010. How is this possible? GPS has taken away the surveying. Sure, I miss the trade craft, but given the choice between spending 90% of my time figuring out where I am versus figuring out the geology, I'll choose geology. The seals on my old Bruntons had rotted away, so I bought a new one and was very pleasantly surprised by a simple but important improvement. Specifically, 
The hinge is now very stiff, and it has a protractor on the side showing the angle between the mirrored cover and the leveled body. The idea is to hold the mirrored cover against a planar surface, hold down the white button, which frees the compass needle, balance the bubble level, and release the white button. The compass is now frozen in position, showing the dip direction, while the protractor gives the dip angle. One measurement versus two. Given the importance of structure within this project, this subtle improvement was almost as important as the GPS. I kept a small Windows XP computer in my backpack. Although it was a challenge to read in direct sunlight, I couldn't have lived without it because every morning in the hotel, I would connect it to the internet, fire up Google Earth, and zoom in on the area that I'll be working in that day. This places the imagery into a cache on the machine, thereby eliminating the need for an internet connection within the field. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but Google Earth is a great digitizing tool. You can add points, polylines, and polygons to Google Earth and export that data into other programs. In this example, I'm plotting betting orientations. By doing this in the field, you can see and immediately investigate things that might have gone unnoticed until drafting the final map in the olden days. This particular example is memorable because I used it as a dowsing rod to guide me along the structural discontinuities that separate these three structural blocks. In 8283, I would create polygonal outlines for each level within an ore body on graph paper. I would then count the cells within the polygon, multiply by the area represented by each cell, and a density conser conversion factor for every stinking level. As more boreholes were added, I'd repeat the process. There were times when the tedium destroyed my will to live. In 2010, I had the equivalent of a 1982 supercomputer in my hotel room. Automated block modeling allowed me to change anything and recompute resources within minutes. Drafting is another anachronistic skill that I enjoyed, but given the speed and flexibility of CAD and GIS, what's the sense? The final difference is maturity and self-discipline. When I walk into a motel room, the first thing I do is unplug the television. This guarantees that I'll walk out of that hotel room or when I check out, with a fully finished report and resource calculations. That comparison took place three years ago. What about today? Let's return to the beautiful painting by Robert L. Connolly from 2003. I am indebted to David Abbott for taking this picture with his smartphone camera at the AIPG headquarters and sending it to me. I'm also indebted to Robert Connolly for letting me use it. Now, there are a few things that Connolly left out, like the plane table, the tripod for the Alliday, the surveying rod, the thermometer for the aneroid barometer, the SLR camera, the vest, the sunglasses, and the beer. In general, though, Connolly nailed this one, and it triggers an emotional response, at least for me, and that's my definition of art. I love this painting. The Alliday, the aneroid, the topographic map, have been replaced by a good GPS. The Brunton, in its case, have been replaced by smartphone apps that measure strikes and dips along with the location and upload the data to the cloud for subsequent download. Some of, some of these applications even generate stereonets. The hand lens has been replaced by digital cameras with macro lenses. Books and maps have been replaced by e-readers, field books, log books, and those really cool leather cases with all of the colored pencils have been replaced by PDAs or digital per, uh, personal digital assistants. These devices have in turn been consolidated and replaced by the tablets and phablets. Some of these tablets are full-blown Windows 8 computers that can in theory replace desktop computers. The simple hand level can be replaced by a $5,000 XYZ laser, a combination of radar gun, compass, and clinometer that communicates via Bluetooth with the tablet so that you can point at a distant object 
and it will add the XYZ offset to the current position of the tablet and it works underground. The hammer, the hydrochloric acid, are giving way to X-ray fluorescence spectrometers. So, you can still look good in the field with the proper neck harness for the tablet and holsters for the laser and spectrometer. The bandana should be tied around the golden retriever's neck because nobody wears bandanas anymore. So what's missing? The ultimate fashion accessory for the well-dressed field geologist. You guessed it, augmented reality goggles. These things are basically heads-up displays that communicate with your tablet just like the Laser XYZ Gizmo and the XRF. Imagine being in the field, looking around, acting cool, and you give a command to your goggles like show boreholes. The goggles send the azimuth and inclination of your viewpoint to the tablet. The software on the tablet reads the GPS coordinates, renders an image of the boreholes, and sends the image to the goggles. X-ray vision. Superman. You can see holes that have been removed by mining. You can see holes within unmined areas. You can even see an ore model superimposed on your reality, your augmented reality. So where is this all going? The Curiosity rover on Mars is a better geologist than any of us because it's operating quite well in an environment that would kill a human within a few seconds. And it's got some outrageous geological gizmos. Aerial drones for spectral surveying are just around the corner. By corner, I mean just around the corner at Sharper Image on the Corner Mall, where you can buy a fantastic four-rotor drone complete with video camera that transmits real-time images directly to your tablet. Autonomous submarine drones are mapping the ocean right now. I mean, right now. Automated LIDAR is replacing underground mapping. Imagine combining the technology with the XRF. Obviously, the future belongs to the drones. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. Okay, that was fun, but let's get real. We'll all be long gone before human geologists are considered to be completely superfluous, despite the opinions of our mining and petroleum engineering friends. All of the really cool stuff is way too expensive for mere mortals. Walking around with $20,000 in gear is a stretch for most of us. So let's get serious and look at what's reasonable for the average Joe. Now, before I dive into this laundry list, I want to point out that there are better options for a few more bucks. Dedicated tablets such as the Trimbles are much better. Real mapping GIS software such as the ESRI and Pitney Bowes products are also much better. But I wanted to describe an El Cheapo configuration as a low-level baseline. The minimum configuration. Here it is. A Windows 8 tablet a Bluetooth GPS that you can glue onto the top of your hat or hang from your pack or belt, Google Earth, which is free, a nice little free program called Goops that will send your GPS data to Google Earth in a way that's much better than the frustrating GPS tracker built into Google Earth, and finally, the Rockworks 16 Level 1 software, also free, that will read the data from Google Earth and do useful things with it. I've been working on a project just south of Golden called Tin Cup Ridge. This involves zillions of strikes and dips. I chickened out on doing a real live demonstration, so I just recorded a Google Earth flyover instead. In this example, we're seeing my stations, bedding plane orientations, faults, and draped geologic maps. The stations with colored stars indicates indicate points that have linked images, meaning that you can click on that point and it will pop up with your field notes and an, an associated picture. Just for fun, I also threw in some background mine level maps and cross sections projected above the ground surface because Google Earth lacks subsurface visualization. 
These can be useful for showing sur subsurface data when exploring the surface. In this, we're seeing orange metastasized rare earth element bearing breccia pipes along the flanks of a magnetic iron deposit in southern Missouri called Pea Ridge. I'd like to end with a rant. People, like me, whine about flying. The flight was delayed, the seats are too small, the TV doesn't work. Wait a minute. You're in a tin can at 35,000 feet, moving at 600 miles an hour. That's a miracle, a friggin' miracle. You should be screaming, holy cow, I'm in a tin can at 35,000 feet, traveling 600 miles an hour. By the same token, let's take stock with where we're at right now. We whine about plus or minus one meter accuracy with our GPS units. We whine about our screens being too difficult to read in direct sunlight. We whine about battery life. We whine about everything, just like we whined about the old stuff. But every now and then, it's nice to think about the technological mirrors that, m miracles that we hold in our hands. A book-sized gizmo that provides instantaneous access to the sum total of all human knowledge. A book-sized gizmo that tells us where we are. A, a gizmo that saves, analyzes, and displays our data. A gizmo that can send all of this information to any location on the planet within a few seconds. That's pretty cool. Well, that's my augmented reality. Thanks for listening.